this is the last presentation for the, for the day, for the week. Um, in Python, that's index negative one. Unfortunately, C++, I don't think supports that particular feature, one of the many reasons why it's inferior. Um, <laughs> so, so basically here I'm going to give, in part, some of my own technical, economic, philosophical overview of, what I, of where I see the future of OEs. In part Ethereum, in part other blockchain related to, uh, and, and decentralized computing related, to, related technologies going in the next two years, five years, uh, 20 years. Uh, so in part the kind of perspective that, I'm, the, that I generally have on this whole space is that I see a lot of, inter a lot of interesting ideas. I see a lot of, uh, well, very, definitely very cool math, definitely very, very cool economics and, and cryptography and so forth. But the and the challenge, but the challenge is trying to figure out exactly, you know, you know exactly what how a lot of this stuff can end up actually being useful. And so, so and so, a lot of the ideas that I that I have are around trying to figure out sort of what is the fundamental, what is the sort of fundamental thing, what is the fundament, what is the fundamental set of parameters that this technology fills in a way that's in a way that's better than any other than any other technology that's available. And so in those areas, those areas where you know, crypto does well and where other areas don't exist at all, those are in theory going to be the areas where you can sort of look for practical applications that are stable long term. And by stable long term, I mean, I mean stable in the sense that people will use them not just behind because, oh, hey, cool, it's Bitcoin, or hey, cool, it's, de it's decentralized, yay, I got to keep my data, but rather, you know, because they're act well, because because they are in some meaningful sense, in some meaningful sense, better, and some, and, uh, and people actually and people actually care about. You know, they'll have properties that people that people like, and the weaknesses will be so small that people won't care about them. So, the um, so well, an important point is that everything we're doing here might end up being completely useless. There's a large probability of that. You know, when you're in a startup, you kind of have to accept that. Well, when you're doing any kind of technology, you kind of have to accept that. You know, how many failed designs have there been for fusion reactors now? But we, but you know, the way that you do development is you sort of assume that your path is 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 going to succeed, and you try and go down that path. And then maybe if you see some fork, you know, you pick you pick the branch of the fork that's more likely to succeed. But you sort of imagine things are going well, and if it all fails, then okay, you know, the 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 sort of bottom, uh, the bottom threshold you can't go below is, is basically the amount of time you've wasted, and that's fine. But hopefully you'll discover something that's actually great and useful. So, um, how do I even move forward here? Uh, yeah. So, one of my, uh, one of, so, I got a couple of sort of secret in this presentation. I got a couple of sort of secrets in the in, in the Peter Thielian sense. Uh, sense of the word. So first one is the history of software development is a history of human beings deliberately employing progressively less and less efficient software paradigms because we like them for other reasons. So <coughs> 1980s assembly, obviously the best and only true way to write code. You know, it's be beat some of these by like a, a factor of several hundred. Machine code in hex. Machine code in hex, even better. Um, actually even better to so just make an ASIC. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, 1920s ASICs, well, we forgot that one. Then we invented this thing called C++, which, you know, which adds a whole bunch of overhead, you know, you have, it's, makes things several times slower, and yet for some, and yet for some reason, it, you know, for some strange reason it won. Then we invented Python and JavaScript, which are, oh my god, even worse. But people like them because, in, in this case, it's because they make development easier. And so the idea is, you know, there's an established history of people, be, uh, in some respects, sacri uh, sacrificing efficiency, and in some cases, sacrificing efficiency by over two orders of magnitude, because it provides some ancillary benefits, and because, as technology improved, it turns out that, you know, for a lot of computations, for for most use cases, the amount of computation that we actually do is pretty trivial, and so slowing it down by even a even by like a factor of ten thousand actually isn't all that bad, so. The sort of theory that may be correct that may be correct that I'm working on here is well, what if decentralized consensus protocols are sort of one of what are sort of a an element of this trend? So not the next element of the trend because this trend is about making things easier and this trend is about making things stress-free, but sort of falling in a similar direction. So 
First off, one thing that people get mixed up about decentralization is there's two kinds of decentralization. One, or, well, there's several kinds, but these are two kinds. So in general, if something is decentralized, what that means is that nobody controls it. And that, by its, that fact by itself mainly has political benefits. Well, so it has, the, it has I would also add in, add in the benefit of, of reliability, but in general, the, the, uh, the, the fact that nobody controls it is, to a large extent, the reason why things should be decentralized as a category in itself. Now, within decentralized, there's also this concept of things being distributed. So distributed, so decentralized and distributed are quite often used as synonyms. In this case, I'm making a distinction. Um, and you know, chances are there are going to be people who try and make different distinctions because all these words are not too clearly defined. But here, the distributed means that the work is actually split up between many parties. And this, when decentralization is the distributed kind of decentralization, you can actually, you can actually see you know, unambiguous te technical, ben technical benefits from making things distributed. So you know, it can provide very, uh, and those technical benefits are so large that even centralized entities are willing to adopt the paradigm. Best example, World of Warcraft. In order to, you know, World of Warcraft actually seeds updates for their, for their platform using torrents. And a whole bunch of other, and a whole bunch of other software does that. You know, Ubuntu distri distributes Linux using torrents, a whole bunch of people use, distribute their stuff using torrents. Consent, uh, now, that's, so that's one kind of decentralization. The other kind is, is consensus. So consensus is somewhat different. So consensus, nothing is being split. Work is just being massively replicated, right? So when work is massively replicated, that's, al that's always going to be less efficient than just doing everything on one server. And so, there has to, and so that, has, that has to be done for other reasons. So, the base, so in general, how do you think about consensus? The basic properties that it has are, it's reliable, guaranteed to keep working. So, and it's, much, it's definitely, I think in the long term, you'll definitely be able to count on it being much more, much more reliable than any one particular service. You know, one particular service is, all, is, is in, in a lot of cases likely to either shut down, um, but transparent, globally accessible, not, con uh, not controlled by anyone. So it doesn't, it, it's not going to shut down. It's also not, it's also a particularly not going to, not going to become evil, it's not going to start installing DRM, it's not going to change its API, it's not going to try and throw captures into its API because it wants to earn marketing revenue. But for all this, or at least in Ethereum 1.0 and Bitcoin 1.0 and every other crypto 1.0, the price you pay is it's 10,000 times slower. So, and that's, you know, if it's a C++ implementation, then that's 10,000 slower than C++ and maybe a million times slower than assembly. And if that's a Python implementation, then it's a billion, then it's a hundred million times slower than assembly. So, you know, less efficient in theory, but the, but the idea is that it's more efficient in practice due to, the, due to the lack of monopoly rent. So, you know, why is it that theoretically, Bitcoin is inferior you know, from a purely technical standpoint to just running everything on a centralized server? The reason, you know, it's pretty obvious why. Bitcoin, there's a send a transaction, it has to get replicated by a few thousand nodes, you got all this sort of wasteful proof of work being done. PayPal, one server, send, done. You know, PayPal might do some replication in it, replication internally for sort of, for just sort of technical redundancy purposes, but even still, that's going to be much more, much more efficient than Bitcoin, which provides both technical redundancy and political redundancy. But in practice, for some reason, Bitcoin charges five cents and PayPal charges 29 cents. So there's an interesting paradox that less efficient in theory and more efficient in practice. Now, what I will say is that you know the, this idea of you know monopoly rent is something that can appear in many ways. So you could have monopoly rent, monopoly rent because of prices. PayPal charges three percent plus twenty nine cents plus one percent for currency convert uh, for foreign transactions plus two point five percent for uh, uh, in uh, currency conversions and and also intangibles. So things like privacy, freedom, you know they might the whatever this. Whoever creates the software might sort of take some extra effort to impose their own ideological vision and so forth. So, the sort of another sort of see, uh, sort of way of thinking about it is decentralization is a commitment strategy that an application developer can use to commit not to being a jerk forever. So, that's be roughly sort of you know what the advantages of consensus are, and so the. 
the way that we can make this kind of architecture actually useful is that, okay, we know what the advantages are. Now let's see if we can shrink the disadvantages to the point where they don't count anymore. So what are the two disadvantages? So, well, yes, for, uh, so one of them is uh, scalability. So fundamental problem in all these architectures, every full node has to process every transaction. So the idea is, well, if we want to improve on this, let's split things up so that's not the case anymore. But we want to split things up so it's not the case anymore while maintaining shared security. So as uh, Dominique Williams, the founder of Pebble, put it, we need to scale out and not scale up. So you know, if you read the sort of Bitcoin foundation scalability roadmaps, they all talk about scaling up and they all talk about how, oh, things are going to be fine if it all gets a thousand times bigger because look, look at this data, we'll just have you know, full nodes in, in, uh, on really powerful, com powerful computers and so forth. Whereas you know, I think if, if we want things to really remain decentralized, I think a sort of more horizontal approach where you, don't, where you actually lose the property that every full node must process every transaction might actually be more appropriate. So you know, the idea is 10,000x, five cents a transaction, it's probably too much to slow down to make the sort of consensus, consensus that's practical in a lot of cases. It's fine for money right now because people are used to paying money in order to transfer money. It's not, it, it, in most other cases, you know, for something like internet forum, name, name registry, whatever, whatever sort of non, you know, time stamping a document, whatever else, people are used to that stuff being free. And so, you know, going from free to five cents is gonna be a bit hard for people to accept. So, you know, you might be able to sort of remove the psychological part of it to a large extent by sort of making the payment happen in the background and just, and replacing the dollar sign with a sort of bar that goes from 100 to zero and then you, and then you just have to pay a dollar once in a while to fill it up again. You know, it's, I was actually just reading some predictably irrational by Dan Ariely and he kind of points out how you can actually remove much of the psychological association with money by sort of creating a separate th measurement thing that's kind of one step removed from money itself. But even still, you know, you're not gonna get rid of the fact that people are used to paying nothing and, they're not, and it'll be hard to get them to pay something. Um, but if you knock it down to, say, a 200x slowdown, then, well, people already do a 200x, take a 200x slowdown voluntarily when they program in Python instead of assembly. And so, you know, if people are willing to do that for, for, ease, for ease of development, maybe they might be able to do that if, because they like the benefits of things being decentralized. Actually, another sort of, one of those sort of Peter Thielian secrets about decentralization that I missed is that I think to a large extent people will like these application developers will want to use decentralized paradigms basically because they're too lazy to manage their own servers. So like that's actually a serious issue that I've had. You know, I've actually tried to maintain to maintain a Bitcoin, a multi-sig Bitcoin wallet on multisig.info, and it just kept on crashing so many times and I had to keep on, you know, babysitting and restarting node.js. So just because of that alone, I'm willing to turn it into a DAP. So, so you know, at 200x, consensus becomes viable for a large number of things. And of course, now you don't need to take a 200x slowdown for everything. As Gav pointed out in one of his recent presentations, you can quite often put, what you really want to do is you only want to put business logic into consensus and everything that's not, con not connected to business logic, you want to put on the user way on the sort of user interface layer inside of an individual, inside of the browser, or you know, inside of a whisper swarm type protocol, a distributed hash table, and so forth. So how do you do it? We kind of talked about this, but just to sort of uh, mm, go through it quickly again. Solution one, sharding, split the state into substates, and the idea is that block makers sort of build on an edge, and when you build on an edge, you process things in, each, in, in both vertices along the edge, and you also sort of move messages along and if you need to send a message from one vertex to a distant, distant vertex, then the message sort of stays in outboxes and eventually as minus mine edges, it sort of makes its way across. You can think of it as being kind of like, I, kind of like the IP protocol, except it's obviously on a chain. And uh, you know, tree chains is not quite the same. It fall in more, it's more sort of this sort of currency specific paradigm that tries to actually split up debit, debits and credits. Hypercube chains basically is this. Um, and the other sort of key point that it relies on is this idea of jury selection that for any particular, for any particular edge you need, you, the verification set for that edge is taken from you know, this enti this en the entire value pool of the entire system so that everyone in the system is statistically protect protecting the, uh, each individual block 
even though only 200 users are actually protecting each individual block. So that's one approach. So what happens? What would this look like in practice? Ethereum 2.0 becomes a hypercube. Much, you know, target transaction fee, maybe knock it down from 5 cents to 0 0.05 cents, maybe 0 0.01 cents. Ideally, much greater use of on-chain mechanisms. Um, that's, so that's one approach. Other approach is this multi-chain idea. So multi-chain, many blockchains, most of the, you know, there's gonna be some blockchains that have many dApps. Sometimes it makes sense to have your dApps be on the exact same execution environment as all the other dApps because you're interacting really heavily. Sometimes you just want your dApp to be by itself because it's cheaper. Chains can interact either by you know, explicitly interconnecting with each other or by the sort of tier null and type decentralized exchange. And you do a common security via the sort of consensus as a service paradigm where you sort of, you have a chain that has consensus, the a chain that does specializes in voting on data availability. And all the other chains, well, they have, they have this selection rule that at each block height, the only block that's valid is the first val is the first valid block at that height. We define valid by data number one, the thing voted that the data is available, and number two that the height is, and, or number two that there aren't any proofs of invalidity of it, and you determine first by the timestamp that this uh, consensus of the service thing specified. <coughs> so that's the other approach that you can take. You need to standardize very little. Maybe for like clients, you might need to standard. If you want one like client across the entire system, you might need to standardize more. But you know, this is sort of more of a sliding scale. So what does this look like? Ethereum 2.0 blockchain equals the Ethereum 1.1 blockchain, so exactly the same thing. 2.0, so what we'll call 2.0 is like a set of tools for spinning up new blockchains, and it's probably a new sort of high-level language that you know building on Solidity or you know maybe if it, if it were if it were building on Serpent, I would probably call it Hydra just because you know Hydras have multiple heads, and if you cut one off, more of them grow and so forth. Um, <laughs> so. And the idea is you would have this sort of high-level language you could easily use to compile to any kind of crypto-economic structure. So you would have one keyword and you could either compile to code on a blockchain, you could compile to an independent blockchain, or you could, you could compile to an off-chain off audible computation protocol and so forth. And like ideally it would sort of be one language that makes it easy for people to sort of pull in any of these different approaches. So that's the other approach for 2.0. Um, so for uh, one point, for 1.1, Consensus is an issue, so proof of work has problems as we discussed. Centralization is one, mining centralization, mining pool centralization, waste. Um, it's you know given that quite a large number of our user of our user base are, are does sort of comprise of generally you know sort of idealistic and environmental environmentalist type of people. I think you know once if we if the blockchain, the Bitcoin community, or the, the crypto community in general, sticks with proof of work. I think once you know they realize we are going to alienate alienate a large portion of that crowd. So just for that purpose alone, we don't we don't. It might be worth uh, abandoning proof of work. And obviously, we ourselves don't like resources being wasted. Um, creates two conflicting interest categories. That's actually something that we missed because with proof of stake, you just have stakeholders. Well, you have stakeholders and users that don't hold stake, but two categories. Here we have three categories. You have stakeholders and miners and people who don't have waste. And you know, the more categories you have with conflicting interests to some extent, the more, uh, the more complicated the, the analysis becomes. <coughs> so the proof of stake, basically, you no, know, I would call nothing at stake problem solved in the sense that we've discovered an upper bound which is equal to a lower bound, which is this weak subjectivity criterion. So, you know, Hopefully, no need, to, no need to tr either argue that it's not, pos not possible even with weak subjectivity, or try to, or, or even try to come up with clever ways to uh, to avoid it. The problem, sort of, the science has been, I think, settled to a partial, to a, a, a rather substantial degree. Challenge is solidifying the details. So, what would Ethereum 1.1 look like? So, before 2.0, a more a sort of more moderate thing, 1.1. So. Proof of stake, maybe some variant of this sort of slasher 2.0 idea. Always need some proof of work for anti DDoS. Event trees. So the idea with event trees is if you want a DAP or if you want a contract that that makes it that does something that would that would only be actually processed at some point in the future. So you could imagine a contract that says, you know, after 30 days do this. Then you want that event 
So that would have to be an event, and in order for that event to actually be part of, you know, to actually process at a later point in time, it would have to be stored as part of a state in the meantime. And so that would be in an event tree. Minor improvements, um, making the Patricia tree binary instead of hex is probably better. Unchain data structures. So treeps, for example, um, so, or sorry, actually treeps might be a bit too complicated, maybe even heaps, just you know, plain old heaps because they're useful for markets. Because the problem right now is that if you do a sort of market order book on chain, you actually have log cube then overhead because you have a treep, which is log, or you have a heap, which is log n on top of a Patricia tree, which is log n on top of a level db, which is log n. And, you know, we can knock it down to n squared, and that's our, or to log squared, that's already a substantial improvement just by making some first class data structures. Support for EC Schnorr, better signature scheme that supports sort of implicit multi sig without actually being multi sig. And, yeah, so events trees already mentioned, um, alarm, yeah. So privacy, that's actually the other major disadvantage that, so that consensus computing has over centralized servers, which is, you know, in a centralized server, okay, fine, if you provide your data, Facebook has your data, and they're gonna, they're gonna do whatever, you, whatever they want and whatever the NSA wants with your data. If you put your data on a blockchain, then everyone's going to do what they want with your data. So. So now we do advocate DAPs. We do advocate privacy as a uh, use case for DAPs because we know because we know that we can use the blockchain only for very specific things, and we can design DAPs in a sort of model where things are stored, things are stored encrypted and things are not and things are not done done in done in consensus by default. So by default, it's a system where things are encrypted, stored in in the sort of swarm cloud, encrypted with your private key, and that's the end your private key actually directly controls things, so that's fine. But the problem is that if we want things, what if we want, there are gonna be many situations where we simultaneously want privacy and consensus. So for currency, that's actually easier because we can do things like merge avoidance where, you, where basically your wallet pretends behind the scenes that you, have a, that you have 100 separate accounts. You can do coin join, which is decentralized mixing, you can do centralized mixing, you can do blind, blind mixing uh, with uh, open transactions. More complex dApps, they generally require a more complex state, that, and that state would have to intrinsically have a concept of accounts, and then you can't use these tricks. But, so in that case, if you're doing things on chain, you're basically giving, a lot of, you're basically giving it all away. So solution, basically secret sharing, what we're calling secret sharing DAOs. Uh, Nick, Nick Zabo actually invented this concept back in 1997, I believe he called it the, he called it the God Protocol. Um, so that kind of tells you that this is actually damn powerful stuff, potentially. So instead of doing decentralized consensus, consensus computing by replication, you do decentralized consensus computing with uh, secure multi-party computation. So the way that works is you sort of take, take some data, the state is stored in a sort of secret shared form, and there are ways that you can do computation on secret shared data such that the result is secret shared, and, but at the same time, nobody like no individual ever warns anything about the intermediate state or the end state. So blockchain-like security with server-like privacy is the idea. What's the cost you pay? One network message per multiplication. So even worse than blockchains, but you can parallelize it. So this is not something that you know, we, should, we should advocate everything to run on, but it is something that might be useful for some applications. And you know, with business logic, me, you know, uh, a 200 times uh, slow down uh, times another 100 x slow, another 100 x slow down really isn't all that bad because you're just doing like 20 computations. You know, uh, this is this is something that might be worth building on top of Ethereum 1.0 or 2.0. Um, interesting thing about this mechanism actually is that it, it is the privacy part is vulnerable to a 51% attack. So it's not per so it is uh, not it's not quite perfect. But I guess some people might actually like the fact that the privacy is limited because, you know, perfect privacy has a whole has some da dangerous properties. You can do scary, you can do scary stuff with it. But here you actually have this sort of necessarily built-in property that if the, you know if there is this sort of supermajority consensus that something deserves to be revealed, then that thing will get revealed, and potentially after the fact. So interesting. Um, so da. So the next idea, you know, we all keep, we all we all love, but we, nobody understands is DACs, DAs, DAOs. So 
that's another one of those areas where there's sort of a whole bunch of a whole bunch of different ideas. Nobody's exactly sure of what it of what they are, and I've been and I've been sitting there trying to figure out exactly in what way are these DA stars going to be going to be useful? What niche do they fill that existing institutions or existing mechanisms don't satisfy already? So, one answer is corporations, and you actually could put in governments. They exist to quickly form and stabilize complex equilibria. So you know, sim you know simple equal so complex equilibria. You know, simple equilibria we all know. So for example, something like you know, if you have a, if you have a tribe, a tribe in a forest, and they can have a sort of equal a, a, a social norm, which is a kind of a kind of equilibrium where nobody kills each other because if if one person ki if one person kills some other person, then everyone else will ostracize them or will attack them. And if you refuse to ostracize someone who, who has been ostracized, then you sort of join you sort of join the the group of people that get ostracized, and you get ostracized yourself. And you know that's actually that's actually a way that's a way that a whole bunch of a whole bunch of societies actually work, and you could argue our society has some some component of that, and that's relatively simple. The problem <coughs> is the modern world requires us to be able to build these kind of equilibrium social norms that are more complicated. So here's one analysis of a company. So let's say you have a set of customers C. Now each of these customers pays A dollars to a set of researchers R, and they each pay B dollars to a set of manufacturers M, and so forth and so forth. Now. Problem is that these transfers include payment for public goods. So the researchers in this case are not producing a product for customers, they're producing a public good, which the manufacturers and the customers pay for. So this whole thing is not workable piecemeal. You can't have a sort of pure market mechanism or a pure mechanism based on, simple, based on a simple market in which you know, C and R, R and M would both get appropriately subsidized and you would end up in a case where R generally gets underfunded and manufacturers manufacture what it, you know, relative weights of the optimum crap. So what a company is, is a company generates a combined transfer profile. So it says that, okay, the combined transfer profile is that the customers pay $12, researchers get you know, $2 per product, manufacturers get $5 per, uh, $5 per, uh, per product and so forth. And then it sort of solidifies that particular profile via, net, via a, net, a network effect. So that, uh, and that kind, and the, the existence of a network effect is what prevents that equilibrium from sort of sliding down into, well, you know, the customers realizing, well, you know, what if I skip out on the component of the payment of the payment to the researchers? Because the whole thing is sort of mashed together into this, into this bund bundle and it all sort of works together. So DA stars, well, you know, there's this chart that actually made it, thanks to Dave Babbitt, made it onto Wikipedia. So the idea is that this sort of, uh, this sort of autonomous organization, uh, autonomous organizations, and, and the idea is that so far most research in automation has been in automated automation at, at the edges. So, you know, assembly line robots are one example. Just general tools are all partial automation. Laptops are partial automation. <coughs> But the thing that we can do, and the other part, uh, sort of paradigm that we've been under exploring is this idea of automation at the center and humans at the edges. So humans are still perform. There's a lot of labor tasks that have to be done by people. People have, people, uh, have a lot more creativity, at least in, in most cases, than, mach than machines do. At least unless, well, maybe not in art, because to be fair, fractals are pretty, pr are rather pretty. Um, but... You know, more creativity, more intelligence, the ability to understand the real world, and so forth. But then you have you sort of the idea is you either partially or completely or do something to replace the management component at the center, and you sort of replace it with some kind of system that generates equilibrium by itself. So, one one issue is that there are generally two types of complexity. So, human organiz so human organizations are good at generating equilibria that have this sort of subjective type of complexity. So. If you think about the legal system as one big social norm, you know, the question is what constitutes fraud? When does lying by, by omission count? Even, you know, what constitutes violence? What's, what's the exact bright line between, you know, pol between pollution and just, you know, dumping a bunch of sludge onto my house? Um, but blockchains are better at sort of computational complexity. So highly complex state transition functions, you know, having a sort of turnkey programming language, having in, creating, uh, creating all these, uh, are really complicated apps with a whole bunch of lines of code. And the question is, maybe, maybe the sort of new opportunity is some creating equilibria, creating social norms that are subjectively and computationally complex at the same time. So 
that's just, it, it is a theory. It might end up not being a particularly useful avenue once again, but it is sort of an interesting way of formalizing the idea. DAPs, so we like DAP, we as developers, we like DAPs because in part political reasons, we like privacy, we like decentralization, we like the idea of nobody being in control. And you know, we, uh, we wrote the DAPs, we appreciate the cool math that goes behind them. Normal people will like DAPs if they do something useful. So what DAPs could become actually useful? So in this case, useful doesn't mean use, it doesn't necessarily have to mean useful in the, sen in the sense of you know, provi providing value in some particular, or being usable in some puritanical sense of the word use. It just means useful in the sense that attracts people who are cool to be willing to use them. And particularly in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, for reasons other than these two. So realistically, it's gonna be games at first. Easy to write, accessible or understandable by anyone. Probably gonna be the majority use case of Ethereum, I think, at least initially, just because, you know, they're fun, you can write them quickly, people can play them. Yeah, you can do battleships on the blockchain now. And, you know, the reason why you do battleships on, um, battleships on the blockchain is, first of all, you know, you, you, have, you have these sort of games with crypto, with, uh, with crypto tokens involved. Um, the decentralization part helps to make sure helps to make sure that the whole game, that, that the game is fair and that the server doesn't have any kind of hidden advantage and so forth. Um, computational resource markets. So mesh networking is, or the general category of a market for bandwidth is, uh, for market for personal bandwidth is interesting. So, you know, in, for a long-term vision, I've made several speeches where I talk about this idea of where you have, where you replace, you know, you uproot the entire ISP system and you replace it with a big net, a global incentivized mesh network where you have the ability, you have the ability to form a company whose sole purpose is to maintain one wire going from Vancouver and Canada to Melbourne and Australia. And then, and there's a bunch of these sort of single wire companies and maybe some multi-wire companies around the world. And, and you know, you every time when you connect to the network, you use the extra's algorithm automatically find the shortest and cheapest path to wherever whatever store you want to connect to. And who, whoever ends up serving along that path, you just use them. So it completely decentralize everything. Problem is you can't change the world all at once. You need some near-term minimal viable products. So one of them is uh, sharing a Wi-Fi connection. So here's a problem that I've had many times. I go into a new country. I open up my phone and try and connect to some roaming network. No network works, not even the roaming networks. Now I go into, you know, I go onto the streets and I try and look for a Wi-Fi connection. Ooh, free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi. Okay, free Wi-Fi, yay, landing page. Enter your mobile number. So two cases. Case one, I don't, case one, I have a phone. If I have, or uh, case one, I have a phone and it's connected to a network. If it's connected to a network, then that means that I probably also have data and then I don't need your stupid Wi-Fi. Case two, I don't, my phone is not connected to a network and this thing's bloody useless. So what do I do instead? Well, if I have one of these net mesh networking apps, what I can do is I can actually, uh, you know, open, open, up, open up the little app and I can go into some crowded place and hey, look, here's 100 people and at least some of them are already connected to some of these, you know, wireless networks, some of which are locked, some of which are, are, are sort of, free and so, and, and so forth. And I can just, you know, pay, pay somebody whatever once, one cent a megabyte in order to just for, basically act as a proxy for me. This is something that people could benefit from, you know, by the millions ever right today if it was available. Another near term MVP, uh, decentralized VPN. So I've kind of noticed that, you know, when I was in, Ch when I was in China for a few weeks, they're actually, they're actually, you know, just because a lot of the VPNs are centralized, they're actually blocking access to the, to the, the VPN sites. So, and even and when I try and log on to Google with a VPN now, what happens is Google actually detects that you're logging on through, through a VPN and they don't let you log in. So, you know, it's pretty, decentralized VPNs could actually you know, make a substantial difference. And they're not, it's not gonna work as a volunteer service. I think you need to incentivize high quality and the way you incentivize high quality is with incentivization. Now the, you, the reason why you don't wanna use Tor is because Tor is just way too powerful for, no, for most normal people. Normal people don't need three hubs, they just need one hub. Look, they're just interested in you know, protecting your privacy to some minimal extent, getting around some restriction. They don't necessarily need you know, NSA, NSA proof uh, sort of, uh, Either either you know military grade or you know Silk Road grade protection or whatever, they're just trying they're they're just trying to you know hop over for hop, to have some you know minimal level of privacy that they're fine with. So this might actually work substantially. Um, file storage, another one. 
So near-term MVP, content addressable web, I'm sure, uh, I won't get into that because I'm sure Juan talked about it. Supply, so uh, a sort of nice use case of this is that, so one of the things that was pointed out about proof of, about proof of stake is that you lose this ability to, for anyone to, or in theory, for anyone to be able to get some quantity of coins by mining them. And the sort of substitute that you can have is you can have a sort of decentralized file storage market where instead of mining by actually mining, you're sort of mining by you're renting out your hard drive space and storing files for other people. And that's a quick way to earn, you know, whatever few, whatever number of finny a day that you're gonna get. Cloud computing, you know, projects are Golem presented. So you know, this week, so that's just uh, a number of possibilities. So nice things about computational resource markets are, you know, in computational <coughs> land, you can cryptographically prove that certain things happen. So file storage, you use Merkle trees, you can prove that you're storing a file. For, for cloud computing, you can do various sorts of auditable off-chain protocols. So you could do like, you could even do like crazy Merkle tree stack trees hash it, hashing to be able to like very efficiently prove that you're copy, that you computed something in a valid way, or eventually you'll just use skip. So the idea is that you know, these sort of cryptographic protocols, the blockchain can run verifiers and they can make events directly conditional on verification. Uh, security deposits are king. So that's another point. Thank you, Vlad. Um, so, not for coming up with this particular quote, but for just, you know, bringing to my attention the fact that security deposits are rather important. They are. So, that's uh, stable coins, another interesting use case. So, problem is right now, cryptocurrencies are volatile. The reason why they're volatile is that for currencies, price is basically demand divided by supply. Now, it's not a general economic principle that holds generally just say price is dependent on demand and supply. But for currencies, if there's twice as many units of a currency, then the natural thing to do is just for all prices to go up by a factor of two and then everything's sort of in the exact same equilibrium. Cur so current model that we have in most crypto en environments, one coin, stable supply. Now it's, the demand is always volatile, and so volatile demand leads to volatile price. All, B all Bitcoin users must participate in speculation as part of their Bitcoin use. That's one of those. Uh, so. And no, going mainstream will not solve the problem. So you know, there's people who think that it will naturally go, naturally become extremely stable when it becomes mainstream. This is gold, it's as, as, as mainstream as you can get. Top over bottom is about a factor of 4.6. Meanwhile, meanwhile, if you look at the ratio between two fiat currencies, top over bottom is about 1.5 usually. So probably not good enough. It's, uh, and once again, I think that this might be one of those cases where People are willing to people are willing to regress slightly for ideological reasons, but not this much. So one idea is you sort of create stable assets with a self-adjusting monetary policy. Two ways of doing it: endogenous assets. So endogenous means you are, instead of trying to stick. To it, so the exogenous approach is you try and use a sort of decentralized consensus on real-world data to try and perfectly track the U.S. dollar, CNY, and so forth. Endogenous approach is that you try you don't try and stick to any particular fiat currency, you just try and maintain some concept of stable value. And you try and use like various you make estimators based on things like the mining hash rate, uh, things like transaction fees. You can try and build in other markets. So you can like build in a file storage market, and then you can have an estimator sort of listen to the price on, uh, on that market. Now so you create some stable assets, and the theory is that you have sort of two coins, one volatile coin, one stable coin, and that's how networks would work. And the sort of you know, innovation without speculation, I just put that in there somewhat ironically because it's Blockstream's uh, slogan, you know, in their sort of quest to make Bitcoin, uh, uh, Bitcoin maximalism, and making Bitcoin the one currency over, of, all net, uh, of all networks. And my, I argue that Bitcoin is also speculative and, you know, just as, spe just as speculative as some, as some of these crazy alts. And so if we really want people, if we really want to decouple, you know, the sort of volatility, volatility part from the cryptocurrency part, really, like, the volatility is always going to remain because these are assets that have no intrinsic value. It's unavoidable. The thing that we really want to do is we want to try and specialize the volatility away. So we want to create a mechanism where people who want, you know, people who wants to gamble can gamble, but people who, you know, grandma that just wants to keep her, keep her retirement savings safe can also fairly reliably do that as well. So those are just some of you know, the ideas that I think we'll be seeing in, as far as dApps go, as far as scalability, consensus, crypt crypto, the sort of the, the, future of the, the future of the space. So could be the future or it could be a bubble, you decide.